Hello. Okay, so today's video is all about ancient Mediterranean, which we know is unit two, and we are going to be focusing specifically on tradition and change with um, the depiction of the human form. Um, so I'm going to try and make this snappy um, and kind of speed through a lot of things. So that way we can cover a lot of topics really quickly. So first, Mesopotamia. Um, just like quick context review for you, uh, Mesopotamia was the area between the Tigris and Euphrates River, which we know um, was very difficult to navigate and flooded unpredictably. Um, they had to have a lot of slave labor to create effective irrigation systems and we know that this kind of affected their gods that they believed in they were unpredictable and did a lot of things out of wrath and spite um, and we also know that Mesopotamia was comprised of city-states so it was not like Egypt where it was just one dynasty it was a lot of different city-states and they were very connected because they had to trade with other civilizations around them for resources that they lacked naturally. So when we're looking at Mesopotamia, I want for us to just kind of think about um, this question here. How does Mesopotamian art differentiate people and communicate narratives? So I'm gonna have you think about that question uh, while I scroll through some of our artworks here. So first up, our Sumerian votive statues from the temple of Eshwana, Code of Hammurabi, Babylonian, Lamassus from the citadel of Sargon II, Neo-Assyrian, Standard of Ur, and some low relief sculpture from Persepolis. Okay, so I want for you to pick one of those and answer this question. Okay, so let's go back to the idea of tradition. So sometimes traditions um, might be also called continuity. Um, if your FRQ for the AP exam uses the word continuity, just think of continue and continuing traditions. So when we're looking at the human form, we have a lot of cylindrical forms. Um, very frontal sculptures, meaning that they were meant to be viewed from the front. They have composite bodies, which we also see in Egypt. So that means that they have profile heads and feet, but their eyes are frontal. Um, and so are their shoulders. They use a lot of registers, those comic strip bands for narratives, a lot of hierarchy of scale, which is one of our favorite vocab words to use. And then their men are often depicted with ridged beards, prominent brows and smiling faces. So let's look. So here's our votive figures from um, Sumeria. So we have those very cylindrical forms. They're just kind of like this almost like ice cream cone shape. Um, here we can see that very stylized ridged beard um, and prominent eyebrow bone very frontal. We know that these were more detailed on the front than they were on the back. And yes, okay, so let's move on to our code of Hammurabi. So here we see more of a stronger use of hierarchy of scale. Um, this is um, Hammurabi and his god here. Um, Hammurabi looks like he is bigger and taller than the god here, but if he was standing, he would be far, far taller than Hammurabi, but they are still shown at about equal height because that elevates the status of Hammurabi here to his god. We know that this scene depicts Hammurabi receiving, receiving all of the code, all of the laws from his god. 
we see that same cylindrical form, ridged beards, in the Code of Hammurabi. Now, if we get to our Lamassu, we have those kind of smiling faces. Um, and this is a very special composite figure that we have here. So we have wings, we have bull legs, we have some horns, and we have a human face. We have that same tradition of the ridged beard and the prominent eyebrow bone. And here we have some nice kind of additional low relief sculpture here that shows those same traditions. Now, our first non-sculptural piece. So here we have the use of registers and I want for you to think for one second, um, how does this artwork use hierarchy of scale to differentiate who is the most important use specific visual evidence. Okay, so we know that this guy right here is the most important because he is so big, he is bigger than everyone else, he is breaking through the register here. Um, we can see if we get to a closer up, this guy here is also more important. He is larger. We know that we're using, utilizing the tradition of hierarchy of scale within this register. Um, and this is a good example of those composite figures. So we have this eye right here, and it's like it's looking at us um, from the front of the face, but the side or the head is turned in profile. The shoulders are turned straight toward us but the lower half of the body is in profile also. So it's that kind of twisting figure that we also see commonly in Egypt. Cylindrical figures. Again, that just kind of strong eyebrow. Here's some more low relief from Persepolis. I think I'm saying that right. Registers, cylindrical forms, etc. Okay, so let's move on to the traditions of Egypt. A quick context review of Egypt. Um, they were situated along the Nile. They had the kind of opposite of Mesopotamia, regular seasonal flooding that allowed the Egyptians to um, have more agricultural control and stability, which we know is also reflected in their gods um, and their belief system we see a lot with kind of the Nile and the regular flooding um, and just kind of a lot of east to west symbolism also um, with mortuary temples and um, sorry I just got distracted because the Amazon Prime guy is delivering stuff I wonder what it could be um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, mortuary temples uh, on the west side of the river. Remember, that's where the sun sets. That's where life ends. And then all of our other kind of temples on the east side of the river where the sun rises. Um, a lot of the art that we have from them is funerary based. Um, the afterlife was very important to them and preparing for it was even more important. And then we also, throughout the 3,000 years of the Egyptian um, dynasties, we have very, very, very little change in religion and artistic traditions, and that was very purposeful. Um, they didn't want anything to change. They wanted to be as stable as possible politically. Okay, so let's get into it. Two questions for us to think about. Why is there so little change in Egyptian artistic traditions? I think I just answered that for you. And what does it say about their dynasties? Okay, so traditions that we have. Um, we have the elite or gods, so pharaohs or any gods, are depicted as youthful in the prime of their life, perfect, slight muscle tone. They don't want to be too muscular. They don't want to look like they're the ones out there building the pyramids, but they still want to look good. Calm expression and ideal proportions. We know that they measured their canon of proportions in fists. I believe it was 
Uh, average man is 18 fists tall, so go measure yourselves. And then our average Joe is depicted naturalistic. Not ideal, but just kind of what they would look like in real life. So I want for you, pick two artworks from Egypt, um, one that depicts the somewhat elite or a god, and then one that depicts an average Joe. Okay, next with our traditions, we have um, frontal sculpture. So one foot striding forward, equal weight distribution, stiff, rigid, balled up fists, and more traditions that we have registers, hierarchy of scale, hieroglyphs, and then we also have, just like Mesopotamia, that kind of composite stance of figures on 2D surfaces at least. Okay, so this is palette of Narmer. Traditions that we have here, hierarchy of scale, Narmer is depicted here much larger than his Enemy, his enemy is still pretty large to show that um, it was kind of not an easy battle, um, but much, much larger than his servant over here. We're using registers to separate narratives and scenes. We're in that composite stance, so our shoulders are frontal, our head is in profile, our eye, it's kind of hard and small to see here, is frontal, and then our hips and our legs are in profile. Um, this is our Book of the Dead um, from, or of Hunefer. Again, we have registers, um, our gods, and Hunefer, an important guy, are all depicted as these kind of slender, youthful, prime of their life people. We never see anyone who is old or too young. Everyone's kind of like 20s, living their best lives in Egyptian artwork. Please don't put that on your AP exam. Okay, and then for some of our sculpture, um, this is King Tut's coffin. He's depicted here, again, youthful, wearing his name's headdress. He has that false beard, crook and flail to show that he is pharaoh. Um, this is probably our most important sculpture from Egypt. I want for you to write down um, or type in three traditions that this uses. Okay, so th um, a handful of traditions that we have here, we have youthful, prime of their life, slight muscle tone, and this is very typical of Egyptian sculpture. So we have that one foot striding forward. We have equal weight distribution amongst our bodies, so that makes us perfectly symmetrical. I don't think that was on that list that I gave you, but there's a bonus. Shoulders straight and our fists balled up, and we have this kind of calm, composed, almost smiling expression. Here's Hatshepsut, um, one of the sculptures that would have lined um, the walkway up to her mortuary temple. She is also depicted wearing the name's headdress and um, the false beard, but she is depicted as a man. Okay, and then here is our average Joe, right? This is our seated scribe, um, and he's depicted as an everyday person. Um, this is also very frontal. Um, the back is not very detailed. He's depicted um, with some body fat on him to show that he was um, of importance. He was wealthy enough that he could, you know, um, have extra food to eat and not have to do any manual labor. Um, he looks a little bit older, so differences between pharaohs, gods, and everyday people. Now with Egypt, we do hit one kind of weird period of change, um, and that is our Amarna period in Egypt. So changes from tradition that we have with the Armana period. We have elongated heads and necks. This is why a lot of people think that there were aliens in Egypt. 
thin shoulders and slender arms, androgynous, which means that they're not really masculine, they're not really feminine, somewhere in between, curving hips, rounded bellies, full lips, and also very informal and relaxed compared to our other Egyptian artwork. So our artwork that is a symbol of change through Egypt is um, Akhenaten and Nefertiti and three daughters. I hope I got that attribution right. That might be a little bit mixed up. Um, but here we can see their elongated heads. We still have the tradition of the composite figures, heads in profile, eyes frontal, shoulders frontal, lower body profile. Um, we can see kind of on this daughter here, rounded belly, really slender arms, elongated head, very alien-like, right? Okay, let's go to Greece. So, um, through Greece, we have three major political and artistic periods. Archaic, Hellenistic, oops, I said those in the wrong order. Archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. So, a review of Greece, just very quickly. Um, people and the artistic representations that we have of people are physical representations of the Greek ideals, what they value. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is happening in Greece and how does that impact art? So I have this list here of jumbled up traditions from each of these three periods. What I would like for you to do is pick three of them and classify them as either archaic, Greek, no, that's not right. Archaic, classical, or Hellenistic. Um, so three for each period. Okay, so let's go to Archaic Greece. Um, so we know that the Archaic early, or I guess this would be late Archaic um, sculpture was greatly influenced by what was happening in Egypt. So we see traditions from Egypt coming over to archaic Greek sculpture. So we have that one foot striding forward, symmetrical balance, calm, composed face, balled up fists. Um, but we do have nudity here, which we don't have in Egypt. Um, so we can see slightly more muscular stylized braided hair here and here and then we have our favorite that archaic smile which was this representation of moral excellence and perfection right outside equals inside we're physically perfect so we're morally perfect Okay, and then when we move out of the Archaic period, um, we see one major big change between here and here. Go ahead and tell me what that one big change is. I hope you said contrapasto. Um, so we see the shifting of weights. Now this is um, Kritos point. He's not one of our 250 but I believe he is the first example of contrapasto that we have, um, and he is early classical, so he's about 30 years before our Doriferous. So with contrapasto, we see um, weight being shifted to one leg. So this leg here is perfectly straight, and this one is bent and relaxed. So we see on our axis, we start to get less and less symmetrical. So we're still taking this kind of perfect, idealized youth, um, slightly muscular, and we're just shifting the weight with contrapasto, making it more naturalistic. With our high classical, we get even more muscular, um, even more dramatic contrapasto. We see um, kind of the counterbalance of relaxed leg with relaxed arm, tensed leg, tensed arm. And 
we start to also see the slight turn of the head um, because our sculptures are now in the round. So they're not frontal, just meant to be viewed from the front, but we are supposed to kind of walk around this and view it from all angles. So that slight turn of the head invites the viewer around the sculpture. Okay, this is um, East Pediment Sculpture from the Parthenon, the one with the R. So here we have um, high classical sculpture and we have drapery as a tradition. So we have these long, long folds, um, but they create volume. So they're not like super cylindrical like we saw in Mesopotamia. They do kind of create this volume and sense of human form in this very naturalistic way underneath. We have contrapasto, we have naturalistic figures, everybody's in the prime of their life, very youthful, very perfect. Remember, um, exterior beauty and perfection equals interior beauty, this morality, this um, civic duty, etc. Um, here's two female figures um, from high classical Greece. Um, this is our grave stele of Hegesso. Um, she's depicted with what we start to call wet drapery, so this very kind of thin, transparent, very revealing drapery um, because we want to start exploring the female form, but she still has to be clothed. Um, so we have drapery starting to get kind of more transparent and more dramatic with kind of its folds here. This is the, um, do, 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 what is this called? Um, Victory adjusting her sandal, Athena adjusting her sandal, same person. Um, so we see this kind of dramatic balancing act here of Athena, who may or may not have had wings, I don't remember, um, adjusting her sandal slightly, going into maybe the Hellenistic. Okay, here's our, no, I think this is the East Pediment sculpture, I think I was wrong before. Um, Ms. Bartell, where are your notes? Um, so these are um, in the pediment, which is that one part of the architecture that's a big triangle, right, on the facade. Um, so this would have fit into one half of the triangle here. So we have high classical traditions of Greek sculpture, again, athletic, youthful, our bodies are perfect, we're perfect on the inside, I wish that's how it worked, but it's not, guys. Um, drapery, lots of voluminous forms, natural looking poses, all great, all good. Then, bam, we go into the Hellenistic era. So, Hellenistic is very different from high classical. Everybody starts to lose it just a little bit and the art becomes really great. Um, so Hellenistic is all about the drama, right? Um, everything starts to get dramatic. We have more contrast. We have more emotions, more feelings. Um, our winged victory of Samothrace here, texturally very rich with the wings and our drapery that we have flowing. With Hellenistic art, it kind of feels like we have um, taken a snapshot of a moment. I like to say like we press pause um, on the most dramatic moment in a movie. Um, and we definitely have that here with the wind blowing through her drapery. Um, start to get a little bit deeper with our... Um, sculptural forms and that creates a lot of contrast between light and dark just increasing that drama seated boxer over here really kind of pulls on our heartstrings makes us view this person as a real person right even though he is this athletic muscular um boxer he's been defeated right he's all broken and bloodied and bruised um and it's emotional so we have kind of more realistic people less of these like aloof um 
unreachable figures and something that's much more personable and relatable. Um, more Hellenistic for you. Um, this is our Alexander Mosaic, um, which we know shows Alexander the Great over here. And this is a really great example of um, what would have originally been a wall painting turned into a Roman floor mosaic. But we have that three dimensionality still, right? If we look at this horse's behind right here, we have strong lights and darks to create those three dimensional forms modeling as I call it. Um, we have people looking at their reflections in um, do, 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 a shield um, and that kind of dramatic mid-second pause in this battle, that moment when Darius starts to retreat, right? The drama. Another very dramatic piece that we have from the Greeks, um, our High relief sculpture, so again, high relief means that it's sticking out very far from a flat surface, um, creating lots of depth, lots of light and dark, the drama, the textures, all of the diagonal lines, right? We know diagonal lines mean movement, so traditions of the Hellenistic diagonals, emotion, drama, textures three-dimensional forms, realistic, naturalistic figures, still very muscular, um, but more real. Oops. Okay, here's our list again. Now I want for you, go back to classifying these as archaic, high classical, and Hellenistic, but do the entire list, go. All right, our little Etruscans, these are, they're so fun to talk about. So Etruscans were the mother culture of Rome. Um, they had contact with Greece um, and that influences their art and their religion. We know that they kind of took um, the Greek pantheon of gods and renamed them and used them. Um, and they had a lot of elaborate funerary practices that focus, focused a lot on celebration. So our question that we need to ask ourselves is how does Greek art influence Etruscan art? So these are our two Etruscan pieces and here they are with our two archaic Greek pieces. I would like for you to go ahead and answer that question. How does Greek art influence Etruscan? Okay, so um, we definitely see the influence of this kind of archaic smile on our Etruscan sculptures. We also see that like one foot striding forward, specifically here with Apollo, we have muscular figures, but not too muscular, stylized braided hair, we can see here and here. So we're taking traditions from archaic um, Greece. Some of our own Etruscan traditions though, um, the human figure tends to be more relaxed, approachable, personal, um, intimate moments, and also very lively. And the Etruscans loved terracotta, that red clay body um, that we see in the sarcophagus. They have that archaic smile, um, but they have less accurate body proportions and anatomy. So let's look at our two pieces here. So we see that kind of just very like sweet interaction of husband and wife here. We see a lot of focus on upper bodies, but not so much on lower bodies, right? I don't know if you've ever tried to sit like this, but um, maybe if you're a mermaid, it would work, but not very realistic, right? Um, the Greeks were all about their canon of proportions and um, accurately representing the human figure and the... Etruscans were just not about that, right? Um, here with Apollo, we see, um, again, muscular bodies, one foot striding forward, stylized braided hair, archaic smile, still very approachable for a god. 
Here is our um, tomb of the triclinium. Um, it looks very kind of similar to um, this vase that we have from Greece. Um, things are divided into these registers. Um, we know that this is kind of unusual for Greece because we start to get people on different ground lines. Um, but here everyone is on the same ground line, a pretty classical or pretty traditional depiction. Um, very lively. We have dancing, we have music playing, we have people reclining here on their couches, triclinium, room with three couches. Okay, so our Etruscans. Now we know, no, these are the Romans. I goofed. Um, the Romans. So the Romans also had three uh, major political era eras and they were very, very similar to what happened in our Greek culture, right? We know that the Romans just stole everything from the Greeks. Um, and they also just had a very similar like political fate. Um, so we have three major eras. Um, and the questions that we need to ask ourselves are, who is in charge? What do they value? Those are our two questions. So with our Republic era, um, we have Rome being governed by Pat patricians um, and elite families that sat on the Senate. Um, they value the upper class, wisdom, age, patriarchy, devotion to the family, public service. Um, and that is where we get our head of a Roman patrician, right? This veristic style, which is this almost very dramatized age. Um, sometimes they would make people look older than they actually were, but it's a bust. So it's just kind of shoulders up sculpture of a patrician um, who is extra wrinkly and extra saggy skin to show his wisdom um, and his duty, his civic duty that he is fulfilling by sitting on the Senate. Um, this hyper realism, right? Um, and then we transition very quickly into this depiction of the human form. Why don't you talk about um, two differences between the depiction of the human form from the Republic period to the Imperial period? So two... Probably, I'm going to say probably more than two. I don't know why I committed to that. Lots of differences that we have here. So we know that contextually, we have Republic period, we have a Senate, lots of people are in charge, still wealthy elite men, but a Senate of people. Then we have Octavian take total control. He renames himself Augustus of Prima Porta. Um, he becomes the emperor. We know in an empire we have an emperor and we call that imperial. Um, so here he is depicted as emperor and we go back to those classical traditions of the male form, right? Idealized human figure. Muscular, we can see his muscles through his breastplate here. Um, young, athletic, prime of his life. He was much older than this, probably when this was made. Lots of strong drapery, this naturalistic, um, but still very muscular depiction of the human form, standing in contrapasto, head slightly turned, that calm expression, which we know was this reflection of intellectual and being smart and moral and we have a little baby cupid riding a dolphin here's the column of trajan which is a little bit different from those this is imperial um and we have um traditions here naturalistic human forms um, they're supposed to look three-dimensional and realistic. We're using registers here to create this continuous narrative all the way up the column of Trajan. Um, 
pretty realistic sense of space, very orderly. Um, and then we hit late Imperial Roman and we get the um, battle sarcophagus where everything starts to just kind of go a little chaotic, just like we have in the Hellenistic period. Um, so here we have this jumble of figures. Um, we start to stray a little bit from naturalism. So our body proportions get less realistic and become a little bit more cartoony to help us tell a narrative better. So our hands get slightly bigger and so do our heads. We still have three-dimensional forms and um, lots of drapery to help with that, but we start to get those diagonals also that create drama and movement through an artwork. Um, and then this just like crazy jumble of figures to show, you know, Rome was expanding um, and was very big um, and they were losing control and they eventually um, were defeated by the Persians who everyone was always fighting. And then um, another entity from Europe that I can't think of off the top of my head. I'll put it in the notes. Um, yes, late Imperial Roman, very much like Hellenistic, where things start to go a little bit downhill. So, last thing for you. Go ahead and classify all of these terms into either Republic, Imperial, or Late Imperial Traditions.